In this video I want to go through uh, what I call prompt theory and how prompt theory is uh, connected to the, uh, to the complexity of a program and how through prompt theory we can measure the complexity of a program and how prompt theory is connected to the, to the theory of understanding itself. Um, just a disclaimer, uh, I wrote this paper in like, uh, <laughs> in like three hours, so uh, it's definitely the first or second draft. Um, but yeah, I think the, the idea is interesting. So uh, to start off, uh, I want to start with definition. Uh, and actually, another disclaimer, this is totally uh, theoretical, right? I didn't do any, any experiments uh, yet. So just a theoretical framework. Um, okay, to start with, I wanna I wanna define some things, and we're gonna use these definitions to build up to something I call the Shafu complexity. Uh, and okay, so we start by defining a program, and a program P is a function that successfully maps from a set of inputs to a set of outputs. And um, so basically we denote the set of inputs and outputs as uh, I.O. And the set of I.O.s we call M for basically for a mapping function. And in most cases, M is infinite, right? So if you have a function that maps X to uh, X squared, uh, you, have a, you have an infinite uh, number of uh, input output pairs. Um, but uh, but that's not a problem. Um, okay, we also define um, P as a program that maps from I to O, and P is good if it can map most inputs to most outputs correctly. This will become relevant when we talk about um, when we talk about machine learning, where we just have an accuracy. Uh, which isn't perfect, and then we have P is perfect if we can do this with perfect accuracy. So, for example, uh, x squared mapping x to x squared is we can have a program which is perfect, right? Or to some to some accuracy at least. Um, a program is defined in a programming language PL, and we define PL as a finite set of, uh, of valid Unicode characters. Um, and we define the set of our programming language as the set of PL, which is this. Okay, so we define the program, we've sent M, which is a mapping function, we've sent PL, which is a programming language. Now we're gonna define PR and uh, LLMs, so PR, is a finite set of uh, of valid Unicode characters. So uh, just a basic prompt for an LLM, and uh, we define an LLM that maps the an input prompt PRI to an output prompt PRO, denoted as uh, this. In this paper, we want to think about. Uh, we want to think about LLMs that compile uh, compile natural language to executable code. So we think about natural language or PRI as the input, as the natural language input to an LLM and PRO as an output which is execu executable. PRO could be in any uh, programming language in any PL or for that matter, in assembly directly, it doesn't matter. Okay, we have some properties that we're gonna we're gonna define for an LLM. So we say a LLM is universal if if its prompt length is infinite, and for every program, for every program P, there exists a PR such that given the prompt to an LLM, we get a P. 
I'm aware that this is a big assumption, but I want to think about an LLM like I want to make it as theoretical as a Turing machine, right? Uh, when Turing defined the Turing machine, um, he defined it as something that has infinite memory, uh, which we don't have. Uh, but it's useful to think in these terms uh, when when you're trying to establish something theoretical like this. So yeah. Okay. So from here on forward, we always assume that we that the LLM that we uh, that we work with is a universal LLM. Um, so also for the second point, like <laughs> the, uh, this is not proved, right? Uh, there are definitely, there are probably definitely programs where uh, this isn't the case, uh, but yeah, the experiments need to be done. Okay, so now we say a prompt. So there exists an infinite set of prompts, right? If you can, if you think about the, so prompt length is infinite, you have an infinite uh, number of valid uh, Unicode characters there's an infinite set of PRs, but there are valid PRs for a specific program P. So we say LLM PR, if the LLM for a PR is equal P, we say this PR with respect to that program is valid and we denote that, denote that by PR uh, under bar. If if the valid prompt is the shortest possible prompt for P, we denote that by, I actually don't know how to call that, uh, PR under bar over bar or something. So in this case, PR is valid, so PR produces P, but it's the, it is the shortest possible prompt that we can find for that program. Okay, and just to summarize, uh, valid PR is a subset of PR. The shortest valid prompt is a subset of the of uh, of all valid prompts. Okay. And this is enough to define what I call Schafu complexity. So so the Schafu complexity of P is the length of the shortest valid PR. So, yeah, the shuffle complexity of a program is equal to the length of the shortest valid program PR that generates the program. Um, and to understand this on a higher level is basically PR is the shortest valid prompt in a natural language that the LLM compiler understands and uses to uh, and uses to create p okay so basically we think about uh, we think about llm again as a natural language compiler okay so then we also can define the shuffle complexity of a program itself and the shuffle complexity of programming language itself is the average is the average of the shuffle complexities of every program in PL. So we take the we take a specific uh, programming language PL. We take all we take the set of all programs defined in, in PL. And in order to calculate the uh, shuffle complexity, we take the average. We take the average of all shuffle complexities for every uh, for every program. Okay, this can be done to arbitrary uh, uh, arbitrary precision. Uh, the bigger your set of programs, the higher the accuracy here is. Okay, so we can also define the shuffle complexity of M. Uh, remember, M is the mapping function from inputs to outputs. And actually, uh, the way I think about M is like um, like a pro like a problem. You know, we have a problem M, and that problem is precisely defined. 
It is a set of inputs that maps to a set of outputs. And, um, and we can calculate the shaft complexity of M. Okay, we can calculate the complexity of M by taking the average over, again, we're taking the average over every shaft complexity for every program in PL for every programming language so that we that the shaft complexity is minimized. Okay, so we basically we basically average over the length of the shortest valid prompt for each programming language we have for PL. So we basically define the complexity of a program uh, of a problem M by our ability to create short prompts in every possible programming language. Again, this can be, can be uh, done to arbitrary precision um, or basically, actually the set of programming languages is finite, right? So you can do that for every programming language. And the shorter the average prompt in each, ev in each programming language that generates, that generates a program that generates M, that is what we call the complexity of M itself. Okay, so we're trying to minimize the shaft complexity for every program in every programming language. Okay, what we can also use uh, the shaft complexity for is a measure of the of how high level a programming language is. So the higher the shaft com com complexity, uh, the less high level, uh, the less high level a uh, a program is. So. So, for example, um, it basically measures the similarity between a program and a natural language. So. A program written in Python should have a lower shaft complexity than a program written in C. Because the prompt that generates P in Python should be shorter than the prompt that generates P in C. Again, uh, we would need to do some experiments here, but the idea is that the uh, shortness of the prompt Basically, it's a measure of how similar your programming language is to natural language. It's basically a distance function between your uh, program and a programming language to, uh, to natural language itself. Okay. So that is uh, shuffle complexity. Uh, what I want to talk about next is understanding. So I try to... Um, I try to define what understanding means, um, what, what it means to understand a problem, or what it, what it means to understand M. So we define three, um, th uh, three different labels, basically, for understanding. We, there is understood, there is semi-understood and there is not, not understood at all. And how we define these are like this. We say a problem is understood if we, give, if we can define M. Okay, so this is important. We can actually define the mapping from, hmm, from I inputs to outputs. And the corresponding P that can calculate every O for every I in M. So if you go back, we say we understand the problem of if we can if we can define M and we have a perfect P. Okay? This takes the mantra if you understand it, you can program it seriously. Okay? So if you assume 
that the fundamental unit of information is the bit, then a problem, a problem is, is said to be understood if it can be defined by a set of operations, a set of predefined operations over a set of bits. Okay? And it doesn't matter how well it could be natural language into an LLM. Right? It doesn't matter because in the end it compiles to it compiles to a set of bits operations. Okay? So there is no there is no space where you can hide something. Right? Is it, it is perfectly defined. P is perfectly defined as a set of bit operations or bit manipulations. Okay, so for example, the program of determining if a number x is prime or not is said to be understood because it is trivial to generate m and p for it. Okay, and we're not talking about efficiency or, or things like that. It just works. Maybe it could take an arbitrary number amount of time or arbitrary uh, amount of uh, memory, but it maps it correctly. Okay. In contrast, the problem of determining an intelligence is not understood. There exists no mapping function M for intelligence yet. So we haven't come up from uh, for a definition. We haven't defined intelligence yet. And if you cannot define something, you can, cannot define it as a mapping function itself. Um, so intelligence to this point in time not understood. Okay. Where it gets interesting is, is there are problems that I define as semi-understood, where the mapping function m can be defined, but only a good uh, p can be found. Not a perfect p, but a good p. So, for example, if you want to determine if a cat or a dog exists in an image, right, you can define M perfectly. Right? You have a set of pictures and a set of uh, bit flags, basically, that says, is there a dog or a cat or whatever else, right? Um, classical computer vision problem. Um, we cannot, we cannot solve that like we solve the problem of determining if x is prime. Currently, we solve that by, by deep learning, with deep learning methods, for example. So, we can create a p, but we can only create it indirectly, right? So, software 2.0 uh, like uh, Carpathy coined it. It's, it's a different type of programming. And um, it's not direct. We basically use a mathematical method that finds P for us, but P is not perfect. P is only good to some, uh, to some accuracy. Okay. So, we have the three phases, phases for a problem. Not understood, semi-understood, understood. And, uh, yeah, one of the goals of science is to move problems from not understood to semi-understood. Or directly from not understood to understood. Or problems from semi-understood to understood. And that happens all the time, of course. Okay? I still need to figure out the uh, uh, the direct link. So I have an intuition here, but I, I still need to formulate it. Like the uh, the connection between this theory of understanding and uh, prompt theory. But one thing I can say is, if a PR exists that generates P, generates a perfect P, the problem is is um, is understood, 
right? Or at least semi-understood. Because if you think about um, if you think about an LLM as a compiler that takes a prompt and generates P, it um, it creates a a precise program. But actually thinking about it, it could also in theory create something like a neural network. So it doesn't solve it directly. So I think it would be better to say if a PR exists that generates a perfect P, the problem is at least semi-understood. But yeah, if P is perfect, the problem is understood. Okay, so it basically takes the mantra as I've said, if you understand it correctly, you can program it. Uh, you can you can build it as a set of of bit manipulation, and the bit is the uh, the bit is the fundamental unit of of information. So so you cannot hide anything. Okay. So conclusion. Uh, what did we introduce? Here, um, we introduced the shuffle complexity, which is a, I think is, a, is quite similar to the Kolmogorov complexity, if you've ever, ever heard of that. It's similar. Um, it's basically a measure. So in this case, it's a measure of, a, of the complexity of a program. And we relate that to the length of the prompt um, that given as an input to an LLM generates the program. So we relate program complexity to LLMs through, through prompts, through natural language prompts. We also defined universal LLMs. We defined what valid prompts are and the shuffle complexity itself as a set. And I introduced my definition for, for understanding or what it means for a problem to be, uh, to be understood or not. So uh, to summarize, I think this is a, at least an interesting thought experiment. Um, obviously, the LLMs that we deal with don't have a prompt length that is, that is infinite, and this needs to be shown. Um, so yeah, next steps would be actually doing the experiments um, and see uh, and, uh, and actually analyze the results. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. That's, uh, that's prompt theory. I'm I'm uh, I'm Shafu. You can find me on Twitter or shoot me shoot me an email if you're interested in this stuff. Okay. Bye bye.